Okay, so the first talk of the Central European session is given by Yuri Santos Rego from University of Magdeburg. And he'll be talking about geometric conjugacy invariants and Thompson groups. All right, uh, thanks, Michal. Uh, thanks uh, all to the, to the other organizers for the invitation as well. Um, so when I read the conference title, then I just assumed we would uh, discuss games. So that's what we are doing today. Um, we are entering a dungeon called conjugacy classes. So if you're, I mean, just a quick reminder, if you never worked with conjugacy before, just let me just state a few things. I mean, conjugacy is just the thing that we do, or uh, that's how we formalize the concept of studying self-similarity of transformation, so to speak, right? So you can imagine from your linear, recall from your linear algebra courses, if you have say a vector space and two, uh, two linear transformations, then you say that they are similar if you can find an automorphism of your vector space that makes this diagram commute. So that's the whole business with uh, conjugacy, right? Um, it, but you can also, instead of a vector space, you can also picture other things here like uh, nice topological spaces, etc. cetera. Um, so formally, we are just formalizing this, uh, well, we are just formalizing this concept using uh, group theory. So we are looking at groups acting on themselves uh, with this uh, nice uh, relation here. Uh, Whoops, uh, this should be, all ah, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right, so elements are called conjugate in a group. If you can find, uh, so for G and F, if you can find the third element, say H, that satisfies this relation, which is also an equivalence relation. And the orbits under this action are called the conjugacy classes, right? Okay, uh, and the point is that, I mean, so why should you play this game? Uh, if you understand conjugacy classes, then you might have, uh, you might win some algebraic information about your group, say centralizers or representations. And if, you, if your group is acting on a space, on a nice space, then you might get information about the action of its elements on the space, if you understand the conjugacy classes. But for us, I mean, for people that do, um, uh, geometric and combinatorial group theory, there's also sort of a historic motivation because uh, when Max Dean was studying, uh, well, surfaces and low dimensional topology in the 1910s, um, he landed on the geometry of the word problem and uh, also conjugacy classes on the level of the fundamental group correspond to free loops in topological spaces. So uh, with a bunch of ideas in mind, uh, then formulated, uh, so uh, let's call them fundamental problems uh, in group theory. Um, among them, there's the conjugacy problem, which says the following. If you have a finitely presented group, uh, you say that the conjugacy problem for it is decidable. If you can find an algorithm that takes as input uh, group elements and uh, spells out and says whether there is a third element that conjugates one element to the other, right? So this, this is the idea. This is, these are the reminders. Um, and uh, well, just with this in mind, the problem that we face is precisely, uh, well, first of all, trying to describe conjugacy classes in our favorite groups, uh, finally presented groups, and tackling the conjugacy problem for them, right? Um, okay, so if you are playing something, then uh, it's usually advisable to look at the difficulty level. Uh, so how hard can this be? Um, if, well, in geometric group theory, there are a bunch of nice groups that we care about that have a decidable conjugacy problem. Uh, well, pick your favorite from, from this list. So you have uh, lots of interesting groups for us, let's say. Uh, but there are also difficulties regarding uh, conjugacy class and conjugacy problem. I mean, the first thing that you might think about is, of course, asking whether all groups have a decidable conjugacy problem. This is, of course, uh, not true. And uh, if you care about uh, quasi-isometry invariance, this uh, is not the case. I mean, having a decidable conjugacy problem is not a quasi-isometry invariant of finitely presented groups. And there are, let's say, groups. There are also groups with very nice geometric properties that still do not have a decidable conjugacy problem. And of course, in general, we want to know how can we determine, how can, let's say, compute or describe uh, conjugacy classes. Um, okay, so let me just give you sort of a, a brief example. 
Um, and this, this is the point where geometry and combinatorics join our party uh, in this dungeon. Uh, so here's an example of uh, uh, maybe a difficult way to describe conjugacy classes. Um, There's a famous theorem of uh, Brunewald, where he solved the conjugacy problem for many S arithmetic groups. Um, and in particular, in the case of GLNZ, he translates conjugacy classes to um, isomorphism classes of certain modules, right? So, well, okay, if you like algebra, then of course you might say this is, this is nice. Um, but in any case, the question here, the task here is to see whether geometry and combinatorics uh, can be used to describe conjugacy classes. So this actually has been done successfully for a number of uh, families of groups. And I, to the best of my knowledge, uh, besides other examples that we'll see in a second, uh, grade groups are like the, among the first uh, successful examples. And Arting uh, indicated that conjugacy classes and grade groups should um, have a strong relationship with uh, knot and link theory. Um, and uh, many, many decades later, uh, Guba and Sapir translated conjugacy to, uh, into topological properties of nice diagrams in the case of diagram groups. So groups that they introduced um, in um, a monograph in, the, in 1997. Um, and there's also, so if you like uh, right angle data groups, for example, or more generally graph products of groups, so there was a sort of a combination of results that culminated in a geometric proof uh, by Anthony Genevois uh, of uh, the conjugacy problem for those groups using annular diagrams, right? So we also had a nice description of uh, conjugacy classes, both on the combinatorial side. So Michal uh, had a contribution to this and then also using more explicit, uh, let's say topology. And uh, another recent example is a, uh, well, uh, a paper by Timothy Maki, where he translated uh, conjugacy classes to uh, what he calls structural uh, conjugation graphs for Coxeter groups, right? Okay, um, let's pause here and like do a, a training exercise before we venture further into the dungeon. Uh, maybe we can get some, uh, some experience. And uh, this, is, this is an exercise that I hope everyone uh, is more or less familiar with, at least in another language. So there's a well-known uh, result about three groups that conjugacy classes are described by, uh, let's say some certain equivalence classes of cyclically reduced words. The point is that this information here can be translated in a sort of, or can be packed or nicely depicted in a sort of algebra, uh, geometric slash combinatorial sense. Um, let's take the free group with three generators as an example. The point is that you can describe the elements just with sort of labeled line segments. You have the, as nodes, you have your generators and their inverses, and then you uh, uh, connect them with edges. But the point is that you have a sort of um, rewriting rule for those diagrams, right? So if, if you have an edge with opposite uh, or in, inverse labels, then you can cancel them out, right? So this is a sort of a pictorial way to see elements in a free group. It's sort of silly because I mean, we can also just write the words, but let's uh, stick with this idea for a second. And the point is that uh, here elements, uh, the diagrams can indeed describe elements. So elements are equal if they, the reduced line diagrams for them have the same length and labels. So you can think of it as a sort of geometric slash combinatorial uh, definition of elements in the free group, okay? Um, and with conjugacy classes, there's this idea to do the same, but instead of, uh, you cook up sort of uh, diagrams for the conjugacy classes. Um, and you do this by sort of closing the diagrams that you had before. So instead of representing, if you take an element, you can represent it with a circle instead of a, uh, a line, right? While you're, you're still re respecting the rewriting rules. 
And this is sort of, you just take the line diagram for, for your element and then close it by connecting uh, its end, endpoints, right? So here are some examples. Um, you can also have uh, like a loop space in a single element. And as I said, you have to still preserve or respect the rewriting rules, okay? And this sort of translates what we had before. Uh, so elements in the free group are conjugate if the, the corresponding labeled circles uh, coincide or the, their equivalence classes, right? So you can sort of measure uh, conjugacy here or describe conjugacy here using nice uh, diagrams, okay? So, right, this is the point where you can just uh, think about uh, other stuff and the talk is, uh, the half of the talk almost is uh, over. So you can uh, dream or check your email, do other stuff. Uh, but if you want to learn a bit about uh, Thompson groups, then, then stick with me. Uh, so here are the boss levels for today, when we are venturing into this uh, conjugacy dungeon. And luckily, uh, Shaole already gave us a lot of information about Thompson groups. Um, so, okay, what's the history behind them? There's this original trio, uh, three groups introduced by, by Thompson in the 60s. Uh, Shaole talked about uh, uh, the, the bigger group here, V. And uh, they can be seen, I mean, he mentioned precisely this, V is a, a, a group of homeomorphisms of the Cantor space. F can be seen as homeomorphisms of the interval and T of a circle. Um, and I mean, what we call nowadays Thompson groups or Thompson-like groups are just uh, groups that generalize or let's say strongly resemble those original groups of uh, Richard Thompson, like uh, the, uh, mapping class groups that Shaolay discussed in his talk, yeah? And they are, of course, uh, very famous in geometric and combinatorial group theory because they have, uh, well, funny properties, let's say. Um, so just to name a few, I mean, F was the first uh, uh, torsion-free group uh, that has infinite virtual cohomological dimension, but is of uh, homological type F infinity. Um, and T and V were the first examples of infinite, but finitely presented simple groups. And nowadays we can also use Thompson-like groups to cook up infinitely many uh, quasi-isometric classes of finitely presented simple groups. And there's also a bunch of other stuff. I mean, V, uh, for example, despite being of this uh, type of infinity, which is much stronger than being finitely presented, it contains all finite groups. So it, it, in a sense, it's a huge group, okay? Uh, right, so what about the conjugacy problem? Uh, the dungeon where we're at uh, for Thompson groups. So there's, a, there's an interesting history here uh, regarding the conjugacy problem for Thompson groups because uh, in the 70s, Higman claimed that the conjugacy problem for V is decidable, but actually there was a flaw in his proof. And Salazar, Salazar Diaz gave in uh, 2010 a different proof for, for that. So she confirmed. Uh, this uh, does work. Um, and uh, Barker, Duncan, Robertson uh, sort of corrected Higman's ideas and then also used that to show that the Higman Thompson groups, uh, called here G and R, they also have decidable conjugacy problem. And uh, about 20, 20 years later, after Higman's work, uh, Guba and Sapir uh, showed that F, among other diagram uh, groups, also have decidable conjugacy problem. Um, and another more or less 20, uh, or maybe, yeah, a bit less than 20, anyways. Uh, years later, uh, Berke Matucci proved, like, they gave a uniform proof that F, T, and V have the decidable conjugacy problem. By uniform, I mean, it was a proof strategy that worked for the three of them simultaneously. So this is, a, this is a, I mean, if you had, haven't heard about this uh, work of Berke Matucci. It's a wonderful paper, a very nice read. I definitely recommend it. Um, okay, so with this in mind, uh, that, I mean, this new uniform strategy to check that the conjugacy problem for those three are uh, uh, decidable, um, Matucci went on to ask whether this strategy uh, can be used to solve the conjugacy problem for other Thompson groups. And he asked in particular about uh, the braided variant of V and the Brin-Thompson group uh, NV. 
right? So for today, for the remainder of the talk, uh, so the boss of the dungeon where we are at is graded V. Uh, so uh, Shaolei already showed us how to represent uh, the elements of V as pairs of diagram of three diagrams. And what we actually do with VBR to get a definition is something very similar. So here, uh, so Shaolei had pairs of trees, of binary tree, rooted binary trees, right? With the same number of uh, leaves. So I have one of the top, one at the bottom, and then you assign permutations to the, um, to the leaves. And this is uh, what a typical element of V looks like. And that, then there are the rewriting rules for the diagram as uh, Shaole explained. For braided V, you do the same, but instead of just allowing permutations of the leaves, you actually add, allow them to braid among themselves, okay? So we, we are gonna see a sort of, uh, I mean, okay, why is a VBR a boss of this dungeon? Uh, this is just, uh, the group is just trying to scare us off with uh, a huge amount of uh, uh, cool properties. So um, once, I mean, this, uh, there's a bunch, here's a big list of very nice properties that uh, for VBR. Um, one thing that I would like to mention, also draw from uh, Shaolei's talk, that, I mean, he said uh, the, the mapping class groups that he described contained also, uh, let's say, all mapping class groups of a certain type, right? And VBR uh, contains multiple copies of all finitely generated braid groups. So this is, this, is, uh, this is similar to the case of V containing all finite groups. So there are a bunch, uh, there is a lot of uh, interesting groups sitting inside this guy, this VBR. And nevertheless, it's still of uh, homotopical type F infinity. So it's still in particular finitely presented. And it's sort of a tiny version of V in the sense that you can get a presentation for both where V is just the guy where you transform the generators uh, into evolu uh, involutions, right? And uh, other uh, nice properties hold for VBR. So this group gained a lot of attention. Um, and let me give you just, uh, let's say an alternative definition, but now using pictures, using other types of diagrams. So we are using sprages. So this is just a nickname for split, braid, and merge diagram, right? Um, so instead of def properly defining them, I'll just give you examples of what uh, sprages look like. So this is a sprage. So we have, uh, you have a sort of a, um, uh, a source on the top of a cylinder, in the sink, and then your sprage is just the surface embedded here uh, that is allowed to uh, split and then merge back again uh, in a way that what you actually have is really just uh, a depiction of, uh, of a pair of trees. Uh, so one tree at the top, one tree at the bottom, and then braids, uh, and, and then braids happening here in between, okay? So this is a more complicated uh, sprage. Um, These guys here are braiding uh, with one another. And if you recall the use of uh, diagrams, of tree diagrams to describe elements of VBR, then this is sort of the correspondence. Whenever you have this nice diagram with your braids, then you can draw the corresponding uh, sprage here, okay? So VBR using those types of diagrams, so now, uh, our group elements are actually represented by, um, we, I mean, we can call a double or maybe a triple um, of it. It's, a, it's an ambient uh, cylinder, solid cylinder with a surface embedded in it, a surface with uh, very uh, nice properties. And uh, the group VBR is just a set of equivalence uh, classes of those diagrams. So we have to consider also some rules. And these are isotopy and reduction moves, right? And the operation uh, on the group comes from stacking the sprays on top of one another, right? So how, how do you multiply, let's say, braids? You have two geometric braids and then you, with the same number of, um, of leaves um, or, or strands, then you just glue one on top of the other and then, and then you rescale, right? So this is more or less the same thing that you do here 
with those uh, diagrams, with spreages, okay? But you have to consider uh, isotopy. So isotopic uh, diagrams are considered equal and reduction moves, uh, reduction moves also happen. And in this case, uh, I mean, okay, they are easy enough to describe. If you sort of see a, a split followed directly by a merge, then you can replace it by a single uh, strip. Okay. And uh, if you have, uh, I mean, the, the contrary, if you have a, uh, a merge followed by a split, then you can also replace it by, uh, by two strips. And you have to respect here the, uh, let's say the ordering uh, left, right of the uh, strips entering your picture, right? And this, this really has to be, uh, so this disk here, for instance, it really has to be nicely embedded, cannot be twisted like in this case, so this is an invalid reduction. And you can also not invert here or switch the orientations, let's say, on the uh, strips, right? And like I said, the multiplication comes from stacking. If you take those two uh, guys here, then you multiply them by putting one on, the on top of the other, and then you apply, but you are also allowed to apply the reduction rule. So whenever you stack two here, then you already get uh, a reduction of this type because you have this, uh, the last uh, merge of the first sprage is, will be followed by the first uh, split of the second sprage, okay? All right, um, now, now we are ready to fight this VBR uh, in our dungeon. And then uh, the first theorem is precisely uh, that the conjugacy classes in VBR can be nicely described using geometry. So uh, they are described by equivalence classes of closed sprages. So it's precisely, that's why I, I asked you to keep that idea in mind from the free group. We have a nice diagram for our elements, which is really a topological object, a topological space. And then we have this uh, solid cylinder. You can just close it, right? If you have a, a, this cylinder for, with a sprage inside it, you can just glue, identify the top and bottom of the cylinder and you actually get a solid torus, right? And this nice surface embedded in it. So, and you still have to respect some rewriting rules here, of course, but the point is that you can do this with the diagram and they completely describe the conjugacy classes of VBR, okay? And the proof idea is, uh, no, I mean, this is a sort of nothing new. We, really borrowed the ideas from, uh, from Arting from the 1920s and uh, the strategy by Belke Matucci. So in a sense, we are working towards confirming Matucci's question for VBR, right? Okay, we have then this description for the conjugacy class, but the point is we have, uh, okay, we have sort of uh, a surface embedded in a three manifold to describe our conjugacy classes. Uh, this is geometrically nice, but is it possible to use this to um, solve the conjugacy problem? I mean, you have to solve something algorithmically hard for three manifolds in order to uh, solve the conjugacy problem for VBR. But this, this also can be done, and the conjugacy problem for VBR is indeed uh, decidable. So the proof idea is uh, just uh, summarized in a few words. With we get, uh, we take in, as inspiration what happens in knot theory. So we have this nice three manifold and something embedded in it. Uh, and in knot theory, there's a famous theorem of Gordon Luca that says that knots are determined by their complements. So knots in the three sphere are completely topologically determined by their complements. So we do something similar here. We take a closed sprage, reduce it using the rewriting rules. And then we take a sort of, a, we define a complement space in the solid torus. Right? So with this, we get a, a three manifold, an oriented three manifold with uh, where we can sort of draw nice graphs on the boundaries and get uh, very good topological properties. So it's, it's compact, irreducible, boundary irreducible and sufficiently large. You don't have to worry about the, the words. Uh, this uh, is also called being a Haken manifold with boundary pattern in this, uh, in this category. But the main point here is uh, Hacking manifolds with boundary pattern can be compared algorithmically using a very deep theorem uh, of Hacking and uh, Matveev, 
So this is what we do here. Uh, we use this uh, three-manifold uh, strong result from three-manifold theory to get a solution to the conjugacy problem. And of course, now that we leveled up, there are a bunch of uh, other dungeons that we can explore. So there are also braided variants of, T, uh, of F and T. Uh, we can also ask what other information we get from, from those geometric objects. Um, and of course, that's also, a, the, I mean, Matucci's question has, hasn't been solved completely and probably won't because it's very broad. But which other groups are amenable <laughs> uh, to this uh, strategy of uh, closing diagrams um, to solve the conjugacy problem? And that's, uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. And thank you. Thank you for the talk. Do we have any questions? Hi, hi Yuri. Can you say yeah. a little bit more about how, how the equivalent relation of your, your closed diagram works? Mm -hmm. So um, for the diagram, you still have, uh, so when you close it, you still have the same uh, reduction moves that you had before, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, comes into the uh, equivalence classes, but also- and This move actually changes uh, the complement, right? The first move- which Yes, the yes, exactly. So when you take, yeah, the, using the moves, you completely change the complements, which is why you have to uh, take complements for reduced representatives. So we have, you first have to show that you can find a unique reduced representative, which can be done uh, uh, in finite time. And then you compare, we actually compared only the reduced uh, complements. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question as well. So, mm -hmm. and this is a typical question whenever somebody says that something is decidable. So are there any, hints on the co actual complexity because I mean large portion of uh, your work um, relies on the strategy of Belk and Matucci which can be done reasonably efficiently but then there's yeah. the other part when it's about deciding like homeomorphism types of uh, not complements and I have no idea what's the situation there. Yeah so so uh, the, the algorithm is uh, completely theoretical I mean in it, it would never, okay, never is maybe too harsh, but uh, I would just say it, it's not practical at all. Uh, this the recognition theorem of Haken manifolds with boundary pattern is, uh, let's put it like that, extremely exponential. But I mean, even if you, if, even if we, we don't know much about this, uh, this machine of Haken Matviev, uh, the point is that PBR itself is uh, already hard to deal with because you have inside it all copies of, I mean, a bunch of copies of all braid groups at the same time. And the point is that, so this is an obs observation by Max Sapir, the braid groups sit inside BBR um, as, uh, how is it called? Uh, they are Fratini embedded, which means that uh, braids are conjugate in a braid group if and only if they, they are cor the corresponding guys are conjugate in VBR. So when you cook up an algorithm to solve the conjugacy problem for VBR, you are actually you are also cooking up an algorithm that simultaneously solves the conjugacy problem for all braid groups for all n. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, so, I mean, okay, uh, people are still trying to uh, improve uh, the efficiency of um, uh, solutions to the conjugacy problem for braid groups. But this is sort of an indication that uh, VBR, the algorithm for VBR has to be, let's say, uh, in very inefficient. Well, but yeah, I mean, you say very inefficient, uh, for example, does that, would, is there a hope of even getting like an actual upper bound or would it, uh, or is there axiom of choice uh, hiding behind the corner somewhere? Because I mean, uh, there are, there, and there's, there are algorithms such as Makanya Razborov that you know shows that something is solvable, but it's using it, it relies on axiom of choice, which is um, hard to implement. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so I don't recall anything specific. Uh, let's say from from the from Matveev's book uh, about the efficiency of the algorithm. Um, uh, there, there isn't. There, there are attempts to sort of implement partial uh, algorithms. So, partial comparison of Haken manifolds with boundary pattern. This, 
this has more or less a bit of success, but uh, being really, I mean, given a precise uh, upper bound of the complexity, uh, unfortunately, I don't know anything about it. Okay, fair enough. That's good enough answer for me. Any other questions for Yuri? I was wondering if you can say anything about subgroups of these groups in the sense right. that, like, di angular diagrams are kind of like baby Stallings graphs. Aha, uh -huh. ah, okay. Um, that's, uh, that's a good question. So uh, th this would be something I would like to investigate. So one thing that, uh, that I mean, the sort of immediate question about subgroups would be precisely asking about the, con I mean, conjugacy classes for the braided variants of F and T because they live inside VBR. But I mean, it already took quite a bit of work to just have this, uh, res those results for VBR. So we haven't looked uh, into that, but it would be, it would be good to uh, yeah, get much more on subgroups using uh, those manifolds, yeah. Okay. But I haven't done it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Are there any further questions? Well, if not, then let's thank our speaker one more time. Thanks. <laughs>